Hi there, my name is Eva Gelper and I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation where I am the Director of Cybersecurity and the head of EFF's Threat Lab. Uh, I have the unenviable task of bookending a conference where the opening keynote was Alex Stamos. So that's a little intimidating. Um, but I, I hope that I will be able to hold my own. I have chosen to do this with no slides and so I'm going to have to be especially entertaining. There may be some sort of song and dance involved. Um, there will be no song and dance. Um, you don't want to see me dance. You definitely don't want to hear me sing. Uh, there is a reason I went into cybersecurity and not entertainment. Um, so, uh, how many of you here know what the Electronic Frontier Foundation is? Ah, lots of people. I love it when lots of people know what EFF is because it saves me a lot of time from having to explain my job. Uh, for those of you who did not raise your hands, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is a digital security or sorry, a, a digital civil liberties organization. And our job is to make sure that when you go online, your rights come with you. Uh, we've been around since 1990. I was not there then. That was the dawn of time. Dinosaurs were roaming the earth. Uh, I have been at EFF since 2007. Uh, different dinosaurs were roaming the earth, sort of me-shaped dinosaurs. Um, so I've, I've been there since 2007. Uh, we are as old as the web, but not as old as the internet, and we know the difference. So uh, we, what, we, what we do is we have uh, sort of taken a look at the problem of making sure that your rights come with you on the internet, and we have come to the conclusion that it requires a sort of Voltron of three different kinds of people. Um, so we employ lawyers. Uh, we have an entire floor of uh, extremely angry attack lawyers. Uh, they do uh, what we call impact litigation. So the, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the ACLU, um, but the whole idea behind impact litigation is that you file lawsuits uh, whose goal is not just to help the people who are involved in the lawsuit, but also uh, to change the law, uh, to set good precedent or to help uh, shut down bad precedent. And one of the reasons uh, why we do this is because back in 1990, we started seeing uh, judges making rulings about what and what was not allowed on the internet uh, that in a way that was not informed by any kind of knowledge of how the internet works. And we were sad. So we deployed many attack lawyers. Um, <laughs> I would love to get up in front of you right now and tell you, oh, judges totally know how the internet works now, lawmakers totally know how the internet works now. The, uh, the problem is now solved and I'm gonna put on a cape and I'm going to fly away. Uh, no, uh, every time that you see a spokesperson for uh, the FBI or some other law enforcement agency get up in front of a group of, of people and tell you that they need a golden key or they need back doors into end to end encrypted communications because it's the only way that they can stop pedophiles and terrorists and terrorist pedophiles. <laughs> People with a fetish for very young terrorists. So in order to stop the scourge of, of uh, child terrorists, they need to backdoor all of our end-to-end uh, -end, uh, encrypted communications, and they swear that they can do this safely. Really, they promise they have such a great track record of keeping uh, all of our important documents safe. Uh, surely they will not say, lose the keys. <laughs> so we're the people who get up in front of, uh, of Congress or the Senate uh, or you know, other legislators and lawmakers, uh, people from law enforcement, people from uh, the sort of surveillance and intelligence community, and say, that's not how the internet works. That's not how math works. That's not how any of this works. And just hoping that it will do this uh, does, not make it, uh, does not make it so. You cannot get up in front of us and say, well, just nerd harder. Surely, if you nerd harder, we will find a way to backdoor encrypted end-to-end -end communications and save the world from the pedophile terrorists and, or the terrorist pedophiles, but definitely very, very scary somebody short, um, possibly even shorter than me. So this, this is the sort of thing that, uh, that, the inter that the EFF is for, and for this purpose, we have lawyers. Um, but 
we have, we have tools other than lawyers at our disposal. Uh, we also have an entire floor of angry activists, people who get out into the streets, people who uh, help to write our privacy and security guides, uh, people who once uh, rented a um, blimp, or was it a dirigible? I, someone here will know the difference. A dirigible and or blimp, uh, which we flew over uh, the NSA data center in Utah uh, to let them know what it's like to, to be watched when you really don't want to. <laughs> they did not appreciate our sense of humor. <laughs> Weirdly unpopular at the NSA. <laughs> sort of in a Snowden-like way. So. We have, we have angry activists. Uh, our activists also have feelings other than anger. They get very excited about the future. Uh, we are, are people who work to protect your uh, right to innovate, your right to buy things and take them apart. Uh, you, you bought it, you own it. You're not just renting it. Um, and that's especially important for security researchers. We have an entire project called Coder's Rights. And the purpose of Coder's Rights is to make sure that if you are a security researcher and you find a vulnerability in something and you want to publish or you want to tell the vendor about it and then they don't do anything and you don't know what to do and you would like to not be sued into oblivion, you can call us. Uh, we are a very strangely popular at DEF CON. Uh, we are the closest thing that DEF CON has to a religion. Uh, and part of the reason for this is because security researchers see us as sort of their insurance policy. If they screw up their security research and they get up in front of a bunch of people and they get sued into oblivion, we are the people uh, who they think we will, we will step up and represent them. Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> there are still mistakes that you can make. Uh, but the smartest thing to do if you're a security researcher uh, is before you publish your research, indeed, before you do your research, uh, call up the Electronic Frontier Foundation, have a consultation with one of our coders' rights attorneys, and talk about how you can do your research in such a way that will not get you sued into oblivion or that will result in EFF uh, representing you if you do get sued, ideally not into oblivion. So those are, those are our activists. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have an entire floor of angry and also strangely happy uh, technologists. And uh, those include, you know, sort of the people who make all of our happy little websites and the people who work on our projects and also the people whose job it is to show up in, uh, in front of the Senate or Congress and go, that's not how math works. That's a job. <laughs> a very tiring job. <laughs> So um, our technologists work on a number of really interesting projects. Uh, how many of you here are familiar with CertBot? A few people? All right, cool. So uh, how many of you here know what HTTPS is? I should hope. If you're, OK, cool. So if you've ever deployed an HTTPS cert for free, you probably did it through CertBot. You're welcome. <laughs> um, Many, many years ago, at the dawn of time, I think like five or six years ago, uh, EFF realized that one of the big problems with the internet uh, was that it was really easy to spy on. <laughs> and we could tell because lots of governments were doing it. <laughs> uh, and one of the ways in which we, we sought to make it more difficult uh, was through a more widespread deployment of HTTPS, uh, a project that we called Encrypting the Web. Um, right now, CertBot is the largest uh, provider of uh, SSL certificates uh, in the world. And uh, I think that we've gotten to the point where something like 65% of internet traffic is now encrypted, which makes it much more difficult to spy on, uh, unless you happen to own a cert. So, uh, <laughs> awkward. Um, so that's one of the projects we work on. We also have a... Uh, web extension uh, called HTTPS Everywhere. And uh, this runs in, uh, I think, in Firefox. Uh, and allow, uh, make sure that when you go to a website, if there is a version of the website that is available in HTTPS, that you will use the HTTPS version by default. Um, there is also a setting called HTTPS, uh, or sorry, HTTP Nowhere which means that if you end up going to a website which serves HTTP, that it will simply tell you, eh, no, no, try again, HTTPS. So you can't um, 
accidentally send unencrypted traffic over the web. And that makes us happy. So we have, uh, we have more projects like this, and then, uh, and then we have my team uh, over, over in uh, technical projects. I run a sub-team uh, called Threat Lab. And uh, what we do is we're primarily interested in uh, threats to particularly vulnerable populations. When we talk about privacy and security online, one of the most important things that we need to ask ourselves is security for whom? Security from who? Um, most of the time when we're talking about security in the information security world, we are talking about security for governments, or we are talking about security for enterprises. We talk about security for rich people who can afford a $1,000 iPhone. We talk about security for, uh, for people who uh, live in, uh, in the United States uh, or who live in what is still sometimes laughably referred to as the developed world. Uh, people who control, have full control over their device. Um, how many of you here uh, okay, so I'm guessing everybody has a cell phone. Everybody has a cell phone. Do you share your cell phone with somebody else? Hands up, hands up. Your cell phone, just yours. Uh, there are parts of the world where if you ask exactly the same question, the answer will be very different. There, uh, it is not one cell phone per person in, in sort of that you know, uh, whimsical one laptop per child kind of way. Um, and instead, the, uh, the model that you're using when you need to secure the phone is one in which many different people are using the same device. And this is also true of laptops, this is also true of computers, and this thing makes things more complicated. If you are just building products for the quote unquote developed world where everybody gets their own thing and they don't have to, and they don't have to share it, your, uh, your threat model becomes very different. Um, when you build tools just uh, for the people who have money or just for enterprises or just for governments, uh, the people whose needs get moved to the periphery are usually uh, women, people of color, people in underrepresented communities, people in impoverished communities. When tools are made for them, uh, usually they are made with, uh, with a hidden price because the tools have to be cheap. So if you take a look at, say, extremely cheap uh, burner phones that you can walk into a 7-Eleven you know, and buy right now, uh, you will see that they come with a bunch of pre-installed applications and that you cannot remove them and that a whole lot of them are extremely invasive uh, to your, both your privacy and your security. If you are poor and you are paying for a, uh, for a cheap cell phone, one of the ways in which you are paying is with your privacy. And that is extremely unfortunate. So that's one of the things that, uh, that my team really works to fight. Um, we've had a couple of very interesting projects. Um, my uh, coworker, Dave Moss, has spent a bunch of time working on uh, fighting the use of automated license plate readers uh, by governments. And so uh, one of the things that we discovered was that there is a company called Vigilant Solutions that uh, basically just runs around California uh, picking up the information about where cars are parked and what their license plate numbers are. Uh, and then just selling them to, um, to government actors such as ICE. Um, there was a, um, we had a volunteer. We had a 15-year-old girl come and volunteer at EFF, and we had her do some research for us. And the very first thing that she found was uh, that the company that ran the local shopping mall uh, was employing Vigilant Solutions to keep track of where all of uh, uh, where all the cars were and who these people were and also selling that information to the government. Um, I look forward to hiring her one day. She's going to be awesome. Um, so this is the kind of work that we do. Uh, we have also worked to uh, encourage a number of cities and, uh, and law enforcement uh, to stop using or uh, to commit to not using facial recognition technology 
in their cities. So we've seen uh, that picked up in, uh, in San Francisco, in Oakland, in Cambridge. Uh, most recently, uh, we won the battle in the city of San Diego, which is particularly interesting because uh, in San Francisco and Oakland and Cambridge, they had not yet started these facial recognition programs. But in San Diego, a facial recognition program had been uh, already running for several years. And so uh, it's not like we were stopping some sort of theoretical harm here. Um, our main issue with facial recognition programs is uh, that uh, AI is, uh, is only as good as the material it's trained on. So garbage in, garbage out. Uh, and uh, what has been found with most of the algorithms that are used by, um, by governments and law enforcement is that uh, they're extremely good at identifying white men and less good at identifying everybody else. And I kind of enjoy the idea of a world in which only women of color can get away with crime because <laughs> facial recognition doesn't work on them. I, I actually think that would be, and this is not an official EFF opinion, kind of awesome. Um, however, that's not the way these things play out. Uh, what happens is exactly the other way around. Uh, the people who are most often misidentified by facial recognition are going to be the people who face um, it inaccurate identifications, who are found by the police to be guilty when they are not guilty, who are identified as the perpetrator of a crime when they were not the perpetrator of a crime. Uh, and this is a outcome that falls disproportionately on uh, on women and on people of color, and generally, the further you are from you know your standard white guy, uh, the more your chances are of being uh, of being misidentified. And this is one of the reasons why we are deeply opposed to the use of uh, facial recognition technology, especially by law enforcement, <laughs> um, because we think that it results in not just misidentification but all kinds of harassment. Uh, so that's another thing that uh, the Threat Lab works on. Um, and uh, then there is my own personal pet project. Uh, I have spent the last uh, two years working to eliminate a uh, sort of subset of, uh, of applications for the phone and, uh, and other devices uh, that we call spouseware or stalkerware. Uh, how many of you here know what stalkerware is? All right, so there are some people. That's not bad. OK, so uh, stalkerware is commercially available. Uh, basically, it's what happens when you go to your search engine of any kind and, uh, and enter, like, spy on my girlfriend's iPhone, uh, spy on my boyfriend's laptop. Uh, these, are the, um, these are the apps that come up. And what happens is you, uh, you purchase the app, and with your purchase, uh, comes a file that you will need to install on, on the device that you want to spy on. Uh, often this requires that you have the username and the password and sometimes uh, physical access to, uh, to the device that you want to spy on, uh, which is one of the reasons why for many years people have said, well, that's legitimate access to the device, right? Like if you have physical access to it and you have the, the username and you have the password, then you're the person who deserves access to this device and you can put anything you want on it. Bullshit. Um, if, you use, uh, if you have any idea how domestic abuse works, uh, you can see that this is very often the situation in which uh, domestic abuse takes place and that this is how abusers uh, keep an eye on their victims, often on their victims' families, sometimes on their shared children, uh, sometimes on their friends, uh, in order to continue to abuse them. And the use of, these, uh, of this software is often linked to violence. Uh, I mean, domestic abuse is in and of itself very bad, but uh, specifically, this is the kind of domestic abuse that um, sort of escalates to violence, which I find particularly disturbing. How did I find out about this, you ask? You don't ask. I don't ask. Uh, so uh, as, part of my, uh, as part of my work before Threat Lab, I spent a bunch of time working on uh, tracking down APTs. So APT is just a fancy word of saying uh, state actor. 
Uh, I try not to say nation state actor because nation state actually has a very specific meaning and I have a degree in political science. Um, so I can just hear my teachers yelling at me every time I say nation state actor. So state actor. Um, I spent a bunch of time tracking state actors, specifically uh, sort of low-end state actors that uh, were uh, going after journalists and activists in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Eastern Europe, across Europe, and in, uh, in the United States, and in Mexico. So I wrote reports on uh, APTs in, uh, in Vietnam that were spying on uh, people from the diaspora in, in the United States and in, uh, in Australia. Uh, I wrote reports on uh, an APT based out of Kazakhstan, which was spying on people in the United States and, uh, and Europe. Uh, and I wrote some stuff about an APT in Lebanon that was spying on something like 50 countries all over the world. They were very, very busy and also not very sophisticated. Um, the reason why I was writing these reports was that your crowd strikes of the world um, are very interested in APTs as long as they're sophisticated, as long as they're going after people with money who will buy uh, their fancy reports. And um, not a lot of people were interested in the APTs that were targeting uh, NGOs that were targeting, uh, as it turns out, uh, scientists in Mexico who were doing uh, research on the effects of, uh, of sugar on the human body and whose research was being used in, um, uh, to sort of bolster an argument for an anti-sugar tax, which was extremely unpopular with the sugar industry and therefore some parts of the Mexican government, they got spied on. Uh, journalists get spied on all the time because a journalist's job is essentially to speak truth to power. Uh, journalists work to piss off people in power. And if you have not pissed off somebody in power, you may want to consider the possibility that you are not a good journalist. Um, a few years ago, uh, Google started, a, uh, started this thing called uh, the Google uh, Ad Advanced Protection. And one of the things that they started doing was they started letting people know if uh, they had been uh, targeted by a state actor. Um, but because Google is super cagey and they have a, an entire buildings and buildings of angry attack lawyers, um, they would tell you you have been targeted by a state actor. They wouldn't tell you what state. And when I asked Google, why don't you tell people what state? They said, well, you know, we'll be liable. The state could get you know, offended. But also, uh, we believe that most people know what state they've pissed off. <laughs> Unless you're me, in which case it's a very long list. <laughs> and you get the little state-sponsored warning, and you're like, man, that could be anybody. <laughs> it just causes a lot, of extra, a lot of extra worry. So there I was, working on, uh, on uh, tracking state-sponsored actors, going after people like me, going after people like my friends. Um, and in late 2017, early 2018, uh, it came out that one of the researchers with whom I was doing all of this research and with whom I had you know, sort of like made my career uh, was a serial rapist because, yeah. So I was really, really, really angry and I read an interview with, uh, with one of his alleged victims and the journalist asked her, well, why didn't you come forward earlier? Like, why did it take you years to come forward and talk about how this guy was a, 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 raped you? And she said, because he's a hacker, I was really afraid that he was going to you know, break into my phone. He was going to break into my laptop. He was going to break into all of my devices. He was going to make my life a living hell, and I would not be able to trust any of my electronics. He had, in fact, threatened to do so. And I was so pissed off that I did what I always do when I'm angry. I tweeted. <laughs> And I tweeted in January of 2018 that if you were a woman who had been sexually assaulted by a hacker and you were worried about uh, the, the compromise of your devices, that you could reach out to me and I would make sure that your device got a full forensic analysis. Because this was my understanding of the problem. This is what I thought the problem was. The problem was a bunch of scared women sitting around, you know, worried uh, that their devices were not safe um, and not able to speak up because they were afraid of hackers. 
no, no, this was not the problem. The problem was that I uh, started, uh, I, I was retweeted 16,000 times. It then went around on Tumblr before and after the porn ban. <laughs> it went around on Facebook several times. Uh, it went around on Twitter a number of extra times. And the result was that every day I would wake up in the morning and check my inbox and there would be somewhere between zero and, I don't know, 20 messages from uh, men and women uh, telling me about the worst thing that had ever happened to them. I heard stories from women who were being abused by, uh, by men, from women who were being abused by women, from men who were abused by women, from men who were abused by other men. There was a guy who uh, came in to see me whose uh, former uh, boyfriend had outed him as gay to his extremely conservative Korean family. Super not appreciated. Um, so all, all kinds of people, it turns out, were facing this problem, though the overwhelming majority of the people who came to me were women who were being abused by men, uh, usually their uh, current or, uh, or former romantic partner. Um, and I discovered that the majority of the cases that came to me uh, were not cases where somebody had installed stalkerware. Uh, they were cases of account compromise. And this is great news if you are in information security because we have advice for people who have account compromise problems. You tell them, you know, hey, just change your password to something unique and strong uh, and not easily guessable. Uh, use a password manager. Um, set your uh, security questions as more passwords instead of things that your former romantic partner probably already knows about you, like the name of your first pet. Um, the name of my first pet, Rumpelstiltskin, every time. So we have advice for that. And then, of course, use the, the highest level of, of two-factor authentication that's available and that you're comfortable with. Um, a lot of people argue about exactly uh, what kind of advice to give about two-factor authentication. And I have found that um, these are the two most important caveats. Not every, um, not every account has, uh, you know, good 2FA available. Not all of them have you know, something better than SMS. Um, but if you are going up against a, uh, against a stalker or a former romantic partner, there are situations in which SMS is definitely better than nothing. Um, furthermore, if I can get people to use you know, Authenticator or uh, I could get like all crazy and get them to buy a YubiKey, uh, so much the better. I, I am a, a vicious YubiKey pusher. Like a, like a drug dealer of YubiKeys. <laughs> Basically one of, the, one of the very few companies that I will just unapologetically stand for. Um, are you listening? There's money to fall from the sky. YubiKeys, more YubiKeys, bring me more YubiKeys. So, um, so the, the, these are the things that I'm, that I'm trying to get, uh, to get people to start doing. Um, but what happens if you do all of these things and compromise persists? Uh, usually that's when we start seeing stalkerware. Uh, so we started seeing these, uh, these programs. Uh, there's no point in naming them because they're constantly rebranding themselves and reskinning, but it's like the same half dozen companies over and over again. It's extremely tedious. Uh, and so what do we do when we have a, uh, when we have unwanted software ending up on, uh, on devices, you tell people to use antivirus. That's, Theoretically, the purpose of antivirus, right? To go find unwanted programs on your device. Um, so I ran a bunch of tests and I started doing uh, my tests in VirusTotal and then I ran more rigorous tests by actually buying a bunch of stalkerware and uh, seeing where it was detected. And I discovered that detection rates for stalkerware were actually miserably low. Uh, somewhere in the like 30 to 60% range. Uh, last year when, uh, when I made my report, and I've got another report coming out uh, later this year that will show that they've gotten a little bit better, but mm, there's, there is, uh, as we can charitably say, room for improvement. <laughs> so we started seeing all of the stalkerware. Uh, the antivirus uh, companies are not very good at picking it up. 
So I went to the antivirus companies and I said, hey, uh, there's this, this stuff which is bad and you don't detect it. Uh, and occasionally I would go so far as to ask why, but in the end, it's not important why. Uh, the most important thing is that there is an entire class of, uh, of software that they had previously not paid attention to. Uh, there are some possible reasons, including the fact that you know, abused women uh, don't have a lot of money to blow on, uh, on fancy software. Uh, they are exactly that sort of vulnerable population that, uh, that Threat Lab exists to protect. Um, but also, there was a popular idea that, that spying on your spouse is somehow okay, that it's fair game. That it's okay if they're, you know, if they're cheating, if they're doing something creepy, if, you know, uh, if they might be stepping out on you, then somehow this kind of abuse was justified. And because it was sometimes justified, making it detectable uh, was not a priority. So I flipped out and uh, yelled at the AV companies. And a few of them uh, stepped up and said, hey, we're going to make it a priority to start detecting this kind of software. Uh, those companies were uh, Kaspersky, which at the time really needed a security win. Um, <laughs> I, I know how to prey on the, on the weak in the herd. <laughs> Malwarebytes uh, and uh, also Lookout. Lookout does uh, mostly the mobile. Uh, mobile security, so that was a particularly big win. Uh, and since then, uh, I have uh, helped to put together what we call the Coalition Against Stalkerware. And the Coalition Against Stalkerware includes a bunch of security companies as well as uh, academics who are doing uh, research on the prevalence of stalkerware and stalker, how stalkerware is being used, and the people who are actually uh, doing the work on the ground of helping uh, individual victims get help, uh, which is a, a very exhausting and, and difficult work. So we're uh, partnering with uh, Weissring in, um, in Europe and uh, Operation Safe Escape in the United States and researchers at, uh, at Cornell and I think at the University of Washington. Uh, and we're all working together in order to create uh, some standards uh, for how do you identify when something is stalkerware, because it usually doesn't come with a big stalkerware banner across the top to let you know for stalking. Um, and also uh, to help the AV companies uh, find a way to safely uh, share samples so that we don't have every single one of them reinventing the wheel. Basically, this should not be hard. We just need people to talk to one another. Um, Though, in hindsight, getting people to talk to one another actually very hard. <laughs> Most of my job is this. Um, so, uh, what would I like you to take away from all of this? A couple of different things. Uh, the first is uh, that if you work in information security, your job is important. Uh, I, I know that we're sort of over this whole idea that the personal is political, uh, but your job is political. Your decisions about who to protect and who not to protect, about what products look like, about what products come into existence, uh, those are key decisions. And occasionally, people's lives are at stake. And I want you to think about that when you're doing your work. Um, the other is that where you decide to work matters. Um, if you are working at a company that's doing something unethical, it's your job to stand up. Uh, because nobody else is going to do it. If you are working at a company that is uh, enabling, say, facial recognition technology that's going to misidentify uh, women of color at a rate 100 times as high as uh, that of uh, white men, speak up. Like, this is a big deal, and it's going to change people's lives, and nobody is going to do it but you. I mean, also me, but like, the two of us. That's it. That's the whole thing. Um, and finally, I want to emphasize uh, how important it is when you, want to make, uh, when you want to make change, when you want to represent the voiceless, when you want to help people who are on the periphery get representation in the center, how important it is to actually listen to the people on the ground. Um, not a lot of cybersecurity professionals will get up in front of a room and tell people about a time when they were wrong. And I think 
that the most important thing to take away from my story about, uh, about stalkerware is that I was absolutely wrong about what people actually needed and what could be done uh, in order to get the most bang for your buck in helping them. Uh, and if I hadn't spent a year and a half uh, answering emails and driving across the bay uh, in the middle of the night on a weekend to help people who were worried about having their, uh, their devices compromised, I would never have known. Uh, I would not have settled on the strategy that I settled on. And uh, the things that I had done would have been considerably less effective. So when you're thinking about your activism, when you're thinking about how you're gonna make a difference in the world, think like an EFF lawyer. Think about doing uh, work that has impact. And the impact should be beyond just the person that you are helping immediately. And it needs to help uh, entire classes of people, all kinds of other people who have exactly the same problem. Uh, punch up, always punch up. There's lots of room. And believe me, <laughs> especially if you're as short as I am, uh, there's lots of room, and we need every single last one of you. Thank you very much. You can take a few questions. That's wonderful. By the way, yes. you didn't tell people because maybe you didn't want to, but you can all join EFF, and I encourage you to. I'm not speaking for OWAS. I'm speaking as a person, a caring person who loves what you guys do. Yes, you should join EFF um, because we are a membership-driven organization. We have 40,000 members all over the world, and that's what pays my salary. So if people uh, don't join EFF, uh, I don't get to come out here and, and yell. Um, but also, it makes it a lot harder for us to make a difference. Uh, our uh, extremely large membership base is one of the reasons why uh, People listen to us in Congress and in the Senate, and when we, uh, when we go to the EU, when we speak in front of the UN, one of the very first things that we do is we tell people, we represent a contingency of, you know, a, sorry, a constituency, words mean things, um, a constituency of 40,000 people who care about digital civil liberties. So we need every single last one of you. Uh, in exchange for, uh, for your patronage, uh, we will provide you with so many t-shirts and stickers, you have no idea. <laughs> Next. Awesome. Um, Eva, this is a great talk. Uh, thank you so much for Thanks. coming out here. Um, my name is Bryant Zadigan. Uh, if I can get on a bit of a soapbox. Uh, you mentioned Operation Safe Escape. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Cox, I would be very surprised if he was in the room um, or even here in California right now, but he's, uh, he runs that organization and has been an absolute stellar joy working with him um, and some of the operations he runs, counseling domestic violence folks, like mm -hmm. domestic violence support crews, um, to help people escape these situations. Um, Badass Army, another yep. one that you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, how can we, uh, as people that might not be in a position um, to necessarily, like this doesn't apply to me, but I've heard people with this story who feel like they, they are not in a position of financial safety, where they have a cushion in order to call something out, or, or maybe are in a position where um, they're afraid if they call something out with the industry that they work in that they might be blackballed from other jobs in that world, um, how can we uh, either encourage or still provide some form of safety net or something? How can we, how can we kind of pull together and support people that really do want to do the right thing when they see something horrendous? Well, there are a couple of things that we can do, and uh, I'm especially happy to shout out to Chris Cox because he's awesome. Also, uh, what's, uh, Caitlin Bowden over at uh, Badass Army does incredible work, uh, and I like them very much. Uh, you should also give them money, your copious, copious money, uh, which I'm now asking you to give up uh, by having principles. So uh, one of the things that we can do is actually um, organize at work. Uh, unions are a very strong bulwark against this, uh, against this kind of abuse, that uh, not just the abuse of workers, but also uh, it gives you the leverage to say, this is not the product we want to be making. This is not the, you know, these, these are not the things we want our company to stand for. Uh, companies like Google and Apple um, and Facebook in recent years uh, have proven that they really 
only respond to uprisings among their engineers. So if you don't stand up, nobody else is going to stand up. Um, the other thing that we can do is uh, the more senior you are, the more important it is that your voice be heard and that you provide tactical cover for the people below you. Um, I think it is unfair to call on a bunch of entry level people who have their very first job to put that job on the line in order to do the right thing. The people who should be on the front lines first are the managers and the directors and the people in the C-suites. Uh, the people who have the most to gain from not rocking the boat and from preserving this, the status quo. Uh, because the status quo right now is not acceptable. And if we continue with the status quo, uh, we will see uh, only increased surveillance, we will see decreased privacy, and we will see decreased security. And we will see it first for marginalized people. But eventually, it comes to the center, and it will come for all of us. Um, and I suggest that we don't wait for that. We get up and, and fight before that happens. Good point. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I was wondering if you could comment on the proposed sale of .org from ICANN to Ethos Capital. Why is it happening? What can we do? And sadly, there's a big demonstration tomorrow uh, led by Corey, a yes. friend of ours and yours, I'm sure. Thank you. So um, this is, is not a thing I have been following very closely, aside from bad, bad. Uh, someone is trying to buy .org and it is bad. And I don't just say that because I work at a .org. Um, my uh, coworker, Cory Doctorow, who you may also have heard of, uh, writer of excellent uh, young adult fiction and propaganda, uh, will be running a, a demonstration tomorrow uh, protesting the sale of, uh, of the .org uh, TLD. And uh, basically, we don't want to see this fall into private hands. Uh, I don't, how many of you here remember a time when uh, you can buy it, uh, when you didn't buy domains? When you get it, you could get a domain for free. Yes. Once upon a time, you did not have to pay money for a domain. And then you could get a domain for like 15 bucks, or you could get a domain for 50 bucks. And now God only knows how much money you have to pay for a domain because somebody is already squatting on it. Those of us who got domains very early, yeah get to look smug, <coughs> charge 10K for them. But um, I am not one of these people. <laughs> so yeah, that's the, the primary th uh, takeaway that I want everybody to have is uh, that uh, private, I think a private equity firm is trying to buy uh, .org uh, and the right to sell .org domains. Uh, this is very bad. You should protest with Cory Doctorow tomorrow in LA. Anybody else? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> so I've always thought of uh, EFF as all the stuff that you talked about. Uh, but one of the things that kills me is having a bucket of technology that I can no longer use because it's uh, out of date, not updated uh, by companies, uh, out of support, uh, is affecting legislation that allows me to do more with the stuff that I paid for and should own. Is that something that EFF uh, also cares about? Or Absolutely. Is that we, we care about the, the notion that you bought it, that you own it, uh, that, it, it uh, that you should be able to do whatever you want with it, that it should still function after you buy it. Um, I don't know how many of you here uh, bought uh, Sonos many years ago, but Sonos recently sent out uh, letters to everyone who purchased its product something like 10 years ago and said, yeah, we're just not going to support that anymore. Sure, it's a speaker and it you know, will not fall apart for you know, 25, 30 years, uh, but we've decided we're just not going to support the software, so thanks, bye. We'll give you a discount on new Sonos speakers if you want to buy them. I don't want to buy new Sonos speakers. I want my speakers to work. I want my software to talk to my other software. Uh, this is actually one of the reasons why uh, EFF has been such an enormous uh, proponent of the open software movement. Uh, we think it's really important that you need to be able to, to look at your software. You need to be able to uh, have your, uh, your tools uh, interoperate with one another. And in some cases, even what uh, Cory Doctorow describes as adversarial interoperability which is uh, these things should work together even when the vendors don't want you to. 
Uh, and that is one of the things that we have fought for, uh, not just in legislation, uh, but also in the, in the popular imagination, because uh, the very first thing that you really need to go after is people's vision of what kind of world is possible. And a world of uh, gated garden after gated garden after gated garden is one in which um, we, we suffer because we don't have control over the things that we buy and we don't have real ownership. And most importantly, if you are a security professional, you can't take the damn thing apart and figure out how it works. And I don't know about you, but I became a security professional by taking things apart, not being very diligent about putting them back together again. <laughs> Next question. So I had a question on, there's a new acronym, not that new, but Customer Identity Access Management. Mm -hmm. And effectively the component of managing the ability to sell or share that information. So from an EFF, you know, from your perspective, where are you guys taking that? Because a lot of marketers have their message, corporations have another message. And then really the individual doesn't have as much leverage or messages out there. So where are you guys taking the stance on identity access and management from a consumer standpoint? Well, there's actually a lot of really interesting stuff being done uh, in the area of consumer protection. Uh, EFF has uh, several people on its technical staff uh, who work entirely on consumer protection issues, which is something that was not true a few years ago. Uh, Consumer Reports, of all people, has actually started up a lab during which, uh, which they use to you know, break Internet of Things devices and test out uh, apps. They just published a uh, really interesting story in which they uh, compared a bunch of period tracking apps. Um, again, look at you know, who, whose information gets sold. It's women. Uh, people who are, who are considered to be you know, not, the, not the central market for, uh, for apps or for technology. And it turned out that a bunch of them have uh, security and privacy issues. Big surprise. Um, my uh, coworker, Cooper Quinton, also uh, worked on fertility tracking uh, applications and their security issues a few years ago. And he gave a talk about this with uh, Kashmir Hill at DEF CON, I think, three years ago? Three years ago. Um, so. Do I think people should be able to control their own data? Yes, absolutely. Um, is it easier said than done? Yes, absolutely. Um, is it a fight worth having? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think that the hardest thing about this is that so many middlemen want to step in and say, but we will control the access for your data. Everything will be fine. We'll just take a cut and it will be, you know. Governance. Yes, uh, it will be extremely profitable for us. And uh, I am extremely suspicious of, uh, of all efforts to do so. So uh, yes, a very good idea. Implementation is a bitch. <laughs> Hey, awesome talk, Eva. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, today we had a keynote, the opening keynote by Alex Stamos, and he was talking about trade-offs. And one example he mentioned is trade-off between uh, privacy and safety. And I think he dropped the word that domestic abuse is harder to prove and prosecute due to privacy. When you have end-to-end -end encryption, then few people can interfere. How's your take on that? Is that a trade-off that actually exists from your perspective? Nope. <laughs> you should hear me and Alex argue. <laughs> uh, no, this, this is not a trade-off. Uh, you can make all kinds of arguments about how you know, pedophiles are grooming uh, children on the internet and terrorists are recruiting on the internet and domestic abusers are using the internet in order to, uh, in, in order to track uh, the, uh, their victims, um, but the way to solve these problems is not by undermining everybody's privacy and security forever and ever, amen. It's to really look at the questions of racism and misogyny and inequality. And nobody ever wants to hear we have to deal with the root causes of these problems rather than we have to backdoor everybody's end-to-end -end communications. 
Because backdooring it, everybody's end-to-end -end communications is a thing you can actually do. Whereas solve racism, everybody suddenly looks helpless, like, oh, but how can we possibly do that? Uh, fight misogyny? Oh, no, too hard, too hard. Yeah, this is just, you know, impossible. Um, no, we have to look at the, the core problems because no matter what we do about, uh, about the technical solutions, um, as long as those causes remain, uh, we're just going to be playing whack-a-mole. Anybody else? I think I have, I have 50 seconds. <laughs> well, if there's no further, oh, we have one last ah, one. All ah. right. Who I, shall be last? <laughs> I think ethical questions are, are a little bit difficult and gray sometimes, in yep. particular when you're building something that can be abused, right? I mean, if you've looked at AI, for example, mm -hmm. you can see, you know, see the famous uh, example of misclassifying muffins as uh, chihuahuas, yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you Delicious can use chihuahuas. that any other way. What, do you have sort of a litmus test for ethics for things like this? I mean, when do you say my company is going too far, you know, or when do you look at something and say this is now? I start from a place weaponized. Of, I start by channeling my father. My father used to tell me, if you want to sound like a genius when someone asks you to predict the future, always predict the worst. And the reason for this is that if it comes true, you will look like an amazing, you know, prescient genius. And if it doesn't come true, nobody will remember or care. So start by predicting the worst. Go full doom. Um, and imagine how will these tools be misused? Um, anytime that you come to a decision point and that decision point is, but surely these people mean well. Uh, imagine that suddenly the government is run by fascists. Uh, or white supremacists, or uh, I don't know, people you don't like, just people you really, really, really don't like, people who put peas in their guacamole. <laughs> Imagine a situation in which the, the worst possible scenario and, and accept that as possible. Uh, the second thing that I recommend people to do is uh, to have empathy for people who are not like you. Who is going to be using this technology? Who is this technology going to be turned on? Who is going to be powerless to, uh, to appeal uh, the results of this technology? What's going to happen when the technology makes a mistake? Um, imagine that you are you know, a victim of domestic abuse or that you are a uh, refugee at the border or that you are a uh, Muslim American flying in the United States, or a, uh, any one of like a thousand marginalized populations, and think about how this stuff is going to get pointed at them and what they can do about it. And if the answer is nothing, they're just screwed, that's an edge case, that's a corner case, then you need to, to seriously look at, at what you're doing because it might be wrong. Anybody else? We're good? Can we get a huge round of applause for Eva? Thank you so much. <laughs>